as we go along the way so you don't forget. Uh, again, I'm Bob Zog. I live just down the road here in Carlisle. Bear with me one second. There we go. Um, yeah, I think we'll turn the lights down a bit. Just to recap a bit on what Byrne just said, the Heat Smart Alliance has a mission to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by accelerating the adoption of energy efficient heat pumps in Massachusetts homes and buildings. We consider home heating and cooling and also water heating. We're an all volunteer organization. We currently have 76 participants in 32 different Massachusetts communities and we continue to grow. Our approach is to educate through our website and through events like this to uh, coach, provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to residents who would like to consider heat pumps for their home uh, on an as available basis, I should say. And we'd like to collaborate with other organizations who uh, have similar missions. The Heat uh, Smart Alliance does not accept any referral fees or any donations for manufacturers or uh, installers of equipment. We just wanna make sure that uh, we're as neutral and unbiased as we can be. So why should you consider heat pumps for your home? Let's take a look at energy use in New England. And this slide shows that fully 30% of our energy use is for our homes. And this doesn't even include our vehicles. When we break that 30% down, over 60% is for home heating and cooling, about 17% for water heating, and another couple percent for clothes drying. That totals 80%, and all of those loads, that 80%, those can all be served with heat pumps. So it's a big chunk of our energy use. If you'd like to decarbonize your home, there's really three basic steps. Step number one is weatherize. Insulate and air seal your home to the fullest practical extent. You really want to reduce the amount of heating and cooling your home needs. That's the has the best impact in terms of climate. It's better not to use the energy in the first place. It makes it a lot easier for the heat pump to do its job or whatever heating and cooling system you use. Step number two, electrify. What that means is replace your fossil fuel appliances and equipment with electric, energy efficient electric appliances and equipment. And this is where the heat pumps come in. Step three, shift to renewable electricity. Once you're all electric or in the process of going all electric, be sure you're using renewable energy. You can put solar on your roof, but you don't have to. You can all purchase renewable electricity through the grid. You have a Chelmsford Choice Program. Many of you may be already involved in that. That's one great way to get 100% renewable electricity. There's other options as well. You don't have to the 2020 election will remain secret. The county superior court judge hearing arguments today from prosecutors who argued against the judge's probably needs to be a resolution of media groups that have been made public. I don't know if we can use a way to the silence the audience. So what is a heat pump? Fundamentally, a heat pump is a mechanical device from a cooler place to a warmer place. The heat naturally flows from a cooler place to a cooler place to a warmer place. But if we want heat to go against the natural tendency, we have to use a mechanical device. It's Paul. Can you mute Paul, please? Yeah, we're, we're working on the mute. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. We already have heat pumps in our homes. We don't call them heat pumps. We have refrigerators. We have dehumidifiers. We have air conditioners. They all use the same basic technology. So heat pump technology is nothing new. We've been using it for decades and decades. Heat pumps are available for home heating and cooling. Again, the same piece of equipment heats and cools. They're available for water heating and even for clothes drying and pool heating. This simple illustration shows how a heat pump can be more than 100% efficient. In this example, we're taking one unit of electricity from the grid and we're using it to pump two units of energy from the outdoor air. And that's delivering three units of energy into the home. 
So this is actually 300% efficient. Now, heat pumps vary, some are less efficient, some are more, but that's the, that's the basic idea. Just to emphasize it one more time, heat pumps heat and they cool. You don't need two separate pieces of equipment for heating and cooling. So some of the benefits of heat pumps, first, substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And that's what we're really about here at the Eat Smart Alliance. It also makes your home safer. You don't have a risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. You don't have a risk of fire explosion from combustible fuels in the home. Probably the most difficult to appreciate attribute of heat pumps is the comfort improvement you can see with a modern heat pump. The orange line here shows a typical heating device that has on-off control. And you get a lot of temperature fluctuation as it cycles on, it cycles off, home cools down, it comes on again, home heats up. That has an amazing impact on your comfort. Modern heat pumps are variable capacity. They dial right into the amount of heating or the amount of cooling your home needs. And they hold the temperature very, very constant in your home. Whatever you set the thermostat at, man, it keeps it right there. Really quiet as well. Emissions. So what we're showing here uh, are heating systems, a number of different types of heating systems you might use in a 2000 square foot home of typical construction. This is not your home. It's not necessarily the average home, but it's just an example. And we're showing two types of heat pumps. We're showing natural gas furnace or boiler along with uh, propane fuel oil and electric resistance baseboard. Now the emissions for electricity in this chart are based on what we project over the next 17, 18 years. So over the life of your heat pump, this would, this would be what you would get from the New England grid. As you can see, the emissions reduction here is on the order of 60 or 70%. And if you get your electricity from renewable sources, you virtually take that to zero. So zero carbon emissions associated with your heating and cooling and water heating systems. That is a huge dent in your carbon footprint. So let's talk about some different types of heat pumps so you can get a little bit of an idea of what might be right for your home. First thing we ask people to do is look at your heating distribution system in your home today. And there's two basic types. The first one we'll talk about is hydronic. This can be hot water, or in some older homes, it might be a steam system. You'll have a boiler typically in the basement. You'll have either baseboards or steam radiators uh, throughout your home. You might even have radiant floor heating uh, with the tubing built right into the floor. The other common type is forced air, where you have ductwork that connects to a furnace or in the basement. There may be an air conditioner along with that furnace. Air is returned to the furnace and air conditioner, and then it's supplied back to the home after it's heated or cooled. So we go through that because now we're gonna get into how that might impact the type of heat pump you wanna look at. If you've got hydronic distribution, start with looking at ductless mini split system. Bob, you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Um, now I'm back live. So I was saying, if you have a hydronic distribution system, start by looking at ductless mini split systems. This uh, First illustration shows the simplest system. It's a single zone system. It has one outdoor unit that's paired with one indoor unit that typically mounts on a wall. It's connected with refrigerant lines, so there's no ducts involved. You've got a heating and cooling system with no duct work in your home. Another variation on this is a multi-split or multi-zone system that takes a single outdoor unit and mates it with multiple indoor units. In either case, mini or multi-split, 
there's a number of different indoor units you can pair the unit with. You can have ceiling recess sets, you can have wall units, which are the most common, you can have a floor unit, and you can even have a uh, compact duct system, which allows one indoor head to service two adjacent rooms. And most people keep their existing hydronic heating system as backup. So you don't have to get rid of that system. If you have forced air distribution, central uh, air source heat pump is probably the way to go. You can see the outdoor unit in this picture looks a lot like a central air conditioner outdoor unit, and it does, but it's typically mounted on a pedestal to keep it out of the snow. And this uh, uh, first illustration, we're showing it mated with uh, what we call a hybrid system where there's a conventional furnace plus a coil uh, that the heat pump operates. And this allows you to use uh, fossil fuel as backup to a heat pump for heating. But you can go all electric and the, the unit, the indoor unit, which is typically in your basement will look pretty much the same, except instead of having a furnace paired with the heat pump indoors, it will have uh, a, perhaps a couple electric resistance elements that will do any supplemental heating. But you can go even without any electric resistance heat, heat if you size the heat pump properly. I shouldn't say properly, if you size the heat pump for that purpose. Um, and the ultimate in energy efficiency is the ground source heat pump, sometimes called geothermal heat pump. This heat pump extracts heat from the ground and pumps it into your home in summer, it dumps the heat to the ground. Because of the nearly constant temperature of the ground year round, this allows you to get the highest efficiency. Important caveat here, your existing ductwork has to be properly sized to be suitable for heat pumps. And it should be, in most cases, insulated and air sealed. And your HVAC installer can inspect your ductwork and let you know if it's suitable for a heat pump or can be made suitable. But no worries, even if you're in a very old home and the ductwork really isn't suitable, you can still go with the ductless options we just talked about for hydronic systems. Or if you have electric baseboard, the ductless uh, heat pumps are, are the way you would go. Let's talk just a bit more about the ground source versus air source. The advantages of the ground source are there's more incentives available and tax credits. It gets 50 to 70% higher efficiency compared to an air source heat pump, which is already much more efficient than your alternatives. So that's lower energy costs, lower emissions compared to air source. Better aesthetics outdoors. Once it's installed and you've landscaped, there's no mechanical equipment outside. You see nothing other than what you want people to look at. It's also a factory packaged heat pump. There's no refrigerant line connections that need to be made in the field. And that gives you a little bit better quality control and better assurance that you'll not have any refrigerant leaks. Air source, it's quite a bit lower first cost. Um, it doesn't disturb your landscaping by, you know, with ground source, you have to drill bore holes, you have to bring in a well drilling rig and you have to have space. Um, it doesn't require you know, room for well drilling rig. And there are currently more options available in air source heat pumps for ductless configurations. If you don't have ductwork in your home right now, it, you can do it, but it is difficult and expensive to put in ground source heat pumps. Let's not forget about water heating. Again, that's 17 plus percent of your energy in your home. Heat pump water heaters, also called hybrid water heaters, can save over 60% of your energy and carbon emissions compared to conventional electric. They can give you very fast payback compared to conventional electric, and they can be installed by any plumber or HVAC uh, installer. Now I say any can install it, not all will. So you may have to check around. If your local plumber won't do it, you can easily find one who will. And you can see in these illustrations that it looks a lot like a conventional tank type water heater, but it has this added box on top that houses the components of the heat pump. 
and it's all self-contained, one piece of equipment. Makes a little bit of noise, but it's quite a bit quieter than a home de dehumidifier by my experience. It will cool your basement a little bit, but typically that's not a big issue. Um, it does require a condensate drain or a condensate pump, but again, that's easy to accommodate. Let's talk a little bit about cost. Um, you know, over the years, we've always showed people an energy cost comparison, and I'm going to do that. But I'm gonna tell you first what, we what I did. You all are painfully aware of the spikes in electricity, especially costs that if you've been hit with recently. Gas has gone up as well. Um, I'm gonna show you what this winter looks like. For Chelmsford, you know, the prices you'd be paying in Chelmsford if you're getting your electricity through National Grid and not through your um, Chelmsford Choice Program, okay? I'll explain in a minute why I did that. So that's like 48 cent electricity, that's expensive. So right now, this chart looks quite a bit different than the emissions chart we showed just a minute ago. Natural gas is your low cost heating fuel this winter. It's giving it too straight. It's even edges out a ground source heat pump. Even propane and fuel oil are slightly cheaper than an air source heat pump based on today's electricity prices. However, <laughs> this is this winter. This is not the next 15 or 20 years over which you're going to be using this equipment. Very difficult to predict what the relative costs of fossil fuels versus, versus electricity will look like over the next 15 or 20 years. So we have to accept that uncertainty in life. So those are the facts. Um, let's talk about incentives. The Mass Save program has great incentives for heat pumps. If you install a ground source heat pump, you can get a $15,000 incentive for Mass Save. If you only do part of your home, you can still get $2,000 a ton, and a, a ton is an archaic unit. Uh, most homes would be in the three to five ton range, typically. Air source heat pump, $10,000 for whole home air source heat pumps. And again, if you do a partial, uh, in other words, you still rely on fossil fuel for part of your heating, you can get $1,250 a ton. For water heaters, heat pump water heaters, $750. You don't have to do any paperwork. That rebate goes to the distributor who passes along to the homeowner. And great loan up to $25,000, no interest for seven years. And that includes any upgrades to your electrical panels you might need to make. And some folks might be eligible for some of the income eligible benefits, which are uh, even higher than the ones shown here. And if you go to the MassSave website, you can get all the details. You probably heard about the uh, Federal Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so right away, January 1 this year, 30% tax credit on ground source heat pumps, up to 2,000 tax credit on air source or heat pump water heaters, okay? Again, you have to have the tax liability to take advantage of that, but I think you can spread it out over multiple years if you don't have the uh, liability in the year you install. And there are more rebates coming, incentives coming out of this program. We don't know exactly what they look like yet. They will be income-based, but you might be surprised at how lenient some of those income hurdles might be. Uh, these are preliminary. You know, they're not available yet. I'm not even sure what agency in Massachusetts is actually going to implement the, the federal program. There's a lot of help out there. That's the bottom line. If you're like me and you love to do spreadsheets and financial analysis and paybacks and net present values and all that stuff, that's great, you know, but make sure you're using the right inputs. First of all, don't look at just the cost of the heat pump. Look at the difference between that heat pump and what you would have paid to replace your current heating system and your current cooling system both. That's the legitimate price difference to, to do your analysis on. 
look at the incentives that we just talked about and the value of the tax credits and whatnot. Um, and depending on your value system, you may want to look at, you know, putting some price on carbon emissions. Do you put a value on that in addition to everything else? You might see some increase in value of your home. There are some studies that have shown some significant increases in home value after heat pumps have been installed. And don't forget the comfort and what value you might want to put on that. And as I just mentioned, we have to accept the uncertainties about future energy costs. It's really hard to say how much money you might save or not save on your energy cost bill year to year to year. I will just add this piece. If you do put solar panels on your home, depending how the economics of that work for you, that might significantly reduce what you actually pay for electricity. Your um, Chumps for Choice program today gives you a huge financial advantage over national grid. I deliberately did not use those numbers in that chart I just showed you because we can't count on that being sustained in future contracts. It's a little tricky to assume that you'll always save money versus buying from national grid. You may view that differently, but that's if we were just conservative in doing that. But we have those uncertainties. You can do all these analyses. You have to accept the fact that they're still going to be wrong. <laughs> So what kind of action plan should you put together? This is the most important thing I'm gonna to say today, tonight. Look at your existing equipment. If your heating or cooling equipment is over 15 years old, it's starting to approach the end of its useful life. If your water heater is seven to 10 years old, it's about done based on normal life expectancies. Plan ahead. If you wait for your current equipment to fail, you're going to be in an urgent replacement situation and it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to consider an option other than just replace with what you've had. And then you're going to lock yourself into fossil fuels for another 15 or 20 years. I know everyone is busy but it really does take some advanced planning and maybe even replacing something before it actually fails. Another great time. You don't have air conditioning and you'd like it. A great opportunity to put in heat pumps. Again, they provide heating and cooling and the same equipment. And certainly if you're planning a renovation, an addition, or certainly with a new home, Heat pumps are really the way to go. Um, they can provide 100% of your heating and cooling needs. So how to get started? Well, one resource is the Heat Smart Alliance website, heatsmartalliance.org. We link to a lot of other sites we think have useful information. Get your free mass safe home energy assessment. Even if you've had one years ago, get a fresh one for a couple of reasons. First of all, that helps identify weatherization needs and helps um, that'll help you qualify for rebates. You actually need to get that assessment for to be qualified for many of the mass save uh, incentives. So that's important to remember. And again, you want to insulate, make sure your home is reasonably well insulated in the air seal before you replace your heating and cooling equipment. And this would be true even if you were staying with fossil fuels, frankly. Get advice from a heat pump advocate or coach. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Heat Pump, the Heat Smart Alliance does provide one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's on an as-available basis. And Bern Kosicki is our Heat Smart Alliance coach in Chelmsford. And it'd be a good chance uh, if you do ask for coaching and you can request it through our website. Uh, you might end up with Bern. But again, um, it's a chance we can't accommodate you. Uh, bear with us. We try to do as much coaching as we can, but even without a lot of promotion, we get more requests than we can we can uh, honor. And when you do go out for quotes, we recommend getting at least two or three quotes. You don't need to go crazy. You don't need to get six, you know, or whatever. You may just get overwhelmed with information. 
but every installer will have a different perspective on your home and you'll learn something new each time they go through your home. And then when it comes down to making your choice, yes, first cost is always a consideration, but it shouldn't be the only one. This is your home. It's an investment. Consider the quality of the equipment. Consider the reputation of the installer. Consider your comfort, other factors. So that is uh, the end of my prepared remarks. And um, I am happy to take questions. Between the air system and the ground storage system, um, so it sounds like if you have a current system that's like they support hot water, that kind of thing, you have no air handling at all in your home. Mm -hmm. um, what's the like? Is there one source that would drive the choice there? Sound like air source would be more accommodated by if you have a drop system in your home. Um, so yeah, just to, let me just um, capture the question in the microphone here sure. and then try to respond to it. So the question relates to air source versus ground source and which applies more in um, uh, with hydronic heating versus ducted uh, heating systems. So right now, um, if you have a hydronic heating system, almost all people go with the uh, mini split or multi split ductless products that don't require any duct work. While it is possible to put in a ground source heat pump that couples with your hydronic system, it's uncommon and it's quite expensive. So uh, if you have duct work in your home and your home was built in the last 50 or 60 years, the chances are good your duct work is adequate for a heat pump. The air source heat pump is generally a straightforward. Uh, replacement of whatever you've got now, furnace and air conditioner. There'll be a little bit of sheet metal work they'll probably need to do to make things up. You may need a panel upgrade. There may be some other factors, but the equipment itself is usually fairly straightforward. And as well with ground source, it's fairly straightforward to make that up with uh, existing duct systems. Yes, sir. I think you back on that question. Uh, are you familiar with the air source heat pumps that are actually air water? So it actually incorporates into the hydronic system. Um, that it seems like it's relatively new in the market. That's something that the heat smart alliance is planning on. Yeah, so the question is about uh, air to water heat pumps and um, I didn't mention those as I was going through the options because uh, it is relatively uncommon, uh, but it is not. Uh, a few people do choose to go that way. And what it basically does, it allows you to mate a heat pump with uh, your hydronic distribution system. With the caveat that in most cases, you will need to replace your current baseboard with much larger convectors in each room because you need, it'll operate at a much lower temperature. It might circulate water at say 120 degrees rather than 180. So you have to accommodate that. It also is more difficult to accommodate cooling because now you have to manage how you're gonna drain the condensate away. So it's doable, uh, it's less common, it's more expensive. You do see those systems more in Europe and the equipment is there. But there's, there are a few people who've looked into it. Um, I'm not sure if I know anyone who's put one in. I know some people who've considered it very seriously. But good question. Um, and I think as time goes on, there's so many hydronic systems out there that there's going to be uh, market pressure to get more options available and help bring the cost down. Pardon me? Am I muted? I can't see. No, we can hear you. Okay, no, they tell me I'm good. Thank you. Sorry to jump in. You said you noticed a couple of hands raised um, of yep. people online. Yep. So I don't know if you want to unmute people or take the topic up there and see the question. Or... The library. Uh... Oh, 
also we're not seeing Chapman's piece here, but it's shown in Dr. Right. 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 on there. So what do you yeah, we'll take another question from the audience here. Yeah. Uh, an HVAC uh, scholar said that uh, he doesn't like uh, heat pumps because they cost so much to maintain. What do you think of that? So the question is about the costs of maintenance on heat pumps. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, the, the uh, and, you know, Manufacturers recommend an annual service call, just as you would with a furnace or an air conditioner. So the fees would be similar for that. I'm not gonna suggest anyone do anything other than the manufacturer's recommendation, but I can say I wait for two years to go by because I don't think it's that critical. If I had a fossil fuel boiler or furnace, absolutely I would do annual maintenance because that's a safety issue. And you can't mess around with that. You really do need to have an annual inspection of your equipment if you're burning fossil fuels. But some people do wait a little longer on the heat pump. You know, things can go wrong. You can lose charge, but you know, uh, you're not going to. Nobody's going to get hurt if something goes wrong. I can testify this sort of heat pump resistant to after three years, when I did have um, someone do maintenance on it, there was nothing to do except a tiny bit of cleaning on the outfit, and that's the core. And that was it. Okay, so the speaker uh, questioner just said there has a Fujitsu heat pump. He waited three years to have maintenance done, and there was minimal maintenance needed. So. In general, the maintenance requirements uh, are less, but I certainly don't want to suggest anyone do maintenance. Okay, B um, Bob, this is Nancy. Would you like to um, let Kelly, it looks like Kelly, you're not muted, so you could ask your question if you wanted to. That's great, thank you very much. Bob, that was really a terrific presentation. Uh, thank you for it. Um, what, as you were uh, explaining yeah. that there might be- hang, hang on a second. Just uh, hang on a second, Kelly, uh, uh, bear with me. We're, our microphone is not uh, picking you up quite. Okay. okay, I'm trying again. Can you hear me now? You can't yeah, I can, I can hear you, go ahead. All right, so uh, in, your, in your listing of, of the incentives coming down the road, it looks like it would be prudent to wait until the Massachusetts uh, decides how it's going to spend the federal uh, the, the uh, benefits later on this year. If I were trying to make a decision today, should I wait until the end of 2023? Okay, so the question is about the incentives, the federal incentives. Um, given that some of those incentives haven't been uh, launched yet, would it be prudent to wait a little longer before looking for a heat pump? Um, that's obviously a personal decision. Um, but I think there's pros and cons. One is uh, you might be surprised that it actually takes you six months to go through the decision-making process if you start now. So by the time you actually get ready to spend money, those incentives might actually be there. The installers are very busy right now. They have backlogs. So there is um, there are sizable wait times right now, even if you go through the process and make your decision fairly quickly. Um, just to put things in perspective, Massachusetts, through its MassAid program, spends over a billion dollars, billion dollars a year on incentive programs. That money all comes through ratepayers. That's not tax dollars, but it comes through your utility bills. Now, one estimate I've heard, I don't know how accurate this is, but Massachusetts might expect through the federal program to get about $85 million a year. So it's not a big pool of money compared to what we're already spending. So it may not make that much difference in the end. Now the tax credits, those are real. And I don't know that those uh, fall, those are not really counted in the 85 million. That's just a credit on your tax bill. 
those are great. But the, in terms of the actual incentives, they may they could end up even being uh, limited to um, income eligible markets too. They they might not be any um, market based incentives there. So we don't know. It's a personal choice whether you wait. Okay, if I could follow up, um, it looked like the incentives were heavily weighted toward uh, replacing a gas fired water heater to to uh, a heat pump. Uh, it almost looked like there would be virtually no cost for doing that. Yeah, no, that's where um, we probably uh, all need to look at the fine print. I think the, the wording on the summaries I read are up to $2,000, so there, there may be some caveats, but it's a good point. Um, if you can get 2000 off a heat pump water heater, you'd be crazy not to put one in, I think. You know, as long as your home will accommodate it, they, you can't easily put a heat pump water into a small utility closet, for example. They do need um, some space for air to circulate around them. But if your home can accommodate it, uh, I agree if that incentive is uh, uh, correct, uh, that tax credit is correct, it's gonna be, uh, gonna be a game changer. That's a good point, thank you. Not seeing the buttons here, so. Okay, let me. I'm. Uh, yeah, that was. I just answered that first one. Um, it's only showing me new messages. Fortunately, if you had put a message in chat, you may have to re-enter it. I apologize for that. We're um, not seeing all those messages right now. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, something else I would ask for just the uh, water heater, the, um, the heat pump. So the heat pump water heater, uh, most configurations, there's nothing on the outside of your house. It's all self-contained. And what's the rough, what rough price or something like that? Well, it's a good question. Um, Price has been fluctuating a lot. I haven't seen a heat pump order here price recently, but I'm going to say five or 6,000, something like that. But I do want to make, uh, okay, good. We've got one confirmation in the audience here. Um, but again, if you had to replace your existing water heater, you might end up spending a couple thousand to do that. So the difference may not be that huge. I do want to mention that there are heat pump water heaters available that do put, uh, one heat exchanger outdoors. And there is what's called a solar assisted heat pump that some people are looking into. I'm not sure, frankly, how much the solar really adds to that. I think that maybe more gets you eligible for another solar incentive, which is nice because you call it solar. But if for some reason you, for example, if you have uh, your water heaters in a tight space in a utility closet where you can't get good ventilation, I would really uh, consider that alternative because then it's extracting heat from the outdoor air and you don't have to worry about um, having enough heat available in a small enclosure for your water heater. Yes, go ahead. There's a question on the main split. So, so going on to your example of the thousand square foot house, how many of those units would you put in and what's the area that a single so the question has to do with the uh, mini slash multi-split systems and how many do you need for a home and uh, whatnot. It's a tough question for me to answer. It's better to ask the installers that. Um, generally speaking, you'll have uh, one indoor head in each room you want to heat or cool. And they can they come in quite large capacity so they can heat a big space with one unit. What, where it gets tricky is if you have a small room that's closed off, so it doesn't get air from, doesn't get heat from surrounding rooms very well. Um, you actually can run into the other problem where uh, they don't make the units small enough for that room. And uh, then you're in a situation, do I not put a head in that room or do I put one in that might be a little oversized for the room? Now that's changing manufacturers are coming out with lower capacity heads for that situation. But you don't necessarily need to put one in every room. And I think sometimes, frankly, um, installers are tempted to bid that way. Oh, you want to completely, we're going to put one in every room. 
there's a lot of situations where you don't necessarily need to do that. And, um, you know, it's a good, it's good to push back a little bit on installers if they're putting one in every single room. You may not, that may be overkill. Now those standalone units or you still have a, like a big piece on the outside? You still have a box outside. Wow. And um, so here's another rule of thumb. Uh, the multi-split systems can connect multiple indoor units to one outdoor unit. But sort of the rule of thumb is three indoor heads max to one outdoor unit. Now, some will bid four or five. That's, I'm not saying that's not good, but it's it should trigger a question. To trigger a question because sometimes it's difficult for the unit to modulate capacity over that range for that many units. So some people put in six or eight indoor heads, so they end up with could have two or three outdoor units. Um, but the boxes tend to be a little, they're shaped a little bit differently, a little flatter. Uh, the air flows through horizontally as opposed to vertically up and out, which you get from a, a conventional ducted heat pump. If you have those three heads connected, that's always that work. Oh, so the question is uh, on mini splits, how are uh, that are actually the multi split units? Are the multiple indoor units connected with ductwork to the outdoor unit? Uh, actually, they're conducted, they're, they're connected with refrigerant lines. They're actually small copper tubes. And uh, in retrofits, they'll typically run the, the, um, line sets up the side of your house and they'll put a, a, a set of cover over it. So it kind of looks like a rain gutter. And then they'll go into the, the rooms that are being heated or cooled. But those are much, 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 much smaller than ducts and they lose very little heat uh, in the process of moving that refrigerant to the indoor unit. Sorry, we haven't any luck finding the chat questions. Um, I'd ask if if you uh, if you entered a chat question earlier, uh, um, you might try entering it again. For some reason, we're not picking up the uh, all the chat questions. I apologize. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> So my husband and I looked at this a while ago and the, the, the installer salesman, you know, was was saying that they wouldn't really handle a mini mini winter well enough. And I don't know if you know if you have personal experience with them. You know, it was just sort of like when it gets very, very, very cold. So he was sort of cautioning us against it. Um, but we're still interested in that. Yeah. So. so the question is uh, uh, a person has heard from uh, installers that uh, New England winters are a little too cold for heat pumps. We hear this all the time. And it's really unfortunate that some installers are still saying that. It's simply not true. Heat pumps are used all through Scandinavia. They're used in Anchorage, Alaska. Our winters here in Massachusetts are child's play for a modern cold climate heat pump. Now that said, uh, heat pump's tendency is to be a little less efficient and produce a little less heat the colder it gets. And this is air source heat pumps we're talking about. But some of these, especially the mini split ductless systems can provide useful heating down to minus 13 Fahrenheit or so. We never get that cold. In fact, our design heating temperature in this area is about 8.4 degrees Fahrenheit. We get temperatures below that, but not very often. And again, um, if for whatever reason, it's pra more practical for you to size the heat pump and maybe not do the heating on the coldest day, you can still have a backup heating system, either your conventional fossil fuel or electric resistance. So yeah, that's definitely not the case. Um, you did expose the um, floor shaft. One is somebody was saying we're gonna have to go for next week, which is about oh. maybe two weeks for us. Okay, yeah, so we did uncover a few of the chat questions, so let me get to those and then we'll get back to the live audience. Um, so the first question is, uh, are there any makes uh, that I prefer uh, heat pumps? Honestly, no. I would say um, 
as long as you're buying, you know, a major brand, um, they're all, all the major manufacturers have good products out there. Far more important than brand is that you get a good installer who's going to size, select, and install correctly. Okay. Um, what is the expected life of an air source heat pump outdoor unit? I'll answer it this way. It's probably comparable to a central air conditioner. 15 years, something like that. It can vary. Um, okay, so um, anything else there? Come on. Okay, good. And excellent. Yes, sir. Um, the two lines. One thing it kind of goes along with her question was um, so the sizing of the equipment and those the lines and the coaching help with that at all, like uh, manual training people with calculation on the home. So that was just more of an idea going into kind of a process what they might actually do. So the question is about coaching and uh, how far does the Heat Smart Alliance go in its coaching and assisting with sizing? Um, so we we don't size, we don't attempt to do a manual J, which is the industry standard for uh, figuring out your design heating and cooling loads. Um, the installers should do that. Uh, some of them actually do, and some of them actually do a good job when they do it. But the one thing we do is as a sanity check, and not all not all coaches do this, but some of us will do it. Um, if you have your historical fossil fuel use history going back a couple of years or can get it from your utility. We actually have a little model we use to analyze your historic fuel use to make an independent estimate of your design heating load. It's not perfect, but we think it can be pretty good. Um, and it gives us a sanity check against what the installers are quoting you. The other thing it does is that it allows us to benchmark your home against all the other homes, 70 or 80 odd homes we've analyzed and get an idea, gee, is your fuel use high or low compared to other people who have similar square footage homes? And that may be helpful to identify some hidden weatherization issue. Yes, sir. Two other ways, the first how would you know if the installer is good if you can get that? <laughs> you said, like, a good installer, but how do you know? And then the other thing was just unrelated to this, uh, assuming you have duct work, like you said, it's as long as it's insulated and it feels like, how common is it that that is or isn't the case on all of those? Good questions here. Um, so, first question is really, you know, how you tell if an installer is good and if whether they you know, size your equipment and giving you a good heat load estimate. I assume you meant by estimate the heat load as opposed to price, but yeah. Um, so one way, well, if you get a coach and we do this independent analysis, that's a benchmark. But another way, um, I think you can get a sense from talking to people. We all, we're all forced to make judgments based on the quotes we get, based on the um, interactions we get have with the installer, we can assess whether they seem to know what they're doing. Um, that's another way, uh, another reason to get multiple quotes and yep. one looks way out of line. Um, so yeah, it's not perfect. Um, some people do their own manual, Jay. I've never done one, but that's, uh, that's a lot of work. Um, so the other, and the second question had to do with duct work. If you have duct work in your home, um, you know, how often is it suitable for heat pumps or how often does it really need to be uh, uh, upgraded or maybe maybe you have to go to a, a ductless option in that case. I honestly don't know how common that is. Um, I think the older your home, the more likely that it's not adequate. Um, and it depends a lot, frankly, on how carefully your builders uh, paid attention to what they were doing. Um, but frankly, if your home is more than 20 or 30 years old, there's a good chance your duct work um, is not particularly well insulated or air sealed. Now, how much of a problem is that? It depends on where the duct work is. If the duct works in your attic, it can be a big problem. If the duct works in your basement or 
internal walls. It's in spaces that are basically at least partially heated anyway. It's less big of a deal. Yes, sir. Yeah, just one comment on um, ductwork. Our house is a uh, ranch house. We were built in '67, and um, I think that our second partition was put on in the '70s. Sometime we've only been in there seven years. So, and we have central um, ductwork, you know, for air conditioning and hot air. So that's the system we were we were about. We had in our house. Uh, we installed a central heat pump uh, last fall, and um, that works fine. So um, it doesn't mean if, if the ductwork is over 20 years old, it doesn't automatically mean it's it's not good. Right. And it, it, you're 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 in much better shape if you have a a ranch house where you can see the ducts and uh, and know what's going on there. But some of the returns in the old part of the house are just uh, cover they put on the days, so so you have the the um, rafter on each side, and you put the cover on the bottom, and that's the return. So it's it's not very sophisticated, but it seems to be good enough. So we did get a another question in the chat about the uh, website for requesting coaching. Um, they asked if it could be put in the chat, if the website can be put in the chat. But it's if you just go to heatsmartalliance.org. You can hopefully pretty quickly navigate your way to that heatsmartalliance.org. Oh, one of the contractors uh, in Massachusetts to be on the Mass Save to, to be eligible to get rebates, you have to be, you have to go through the training through Mass Save to get on the list. If homeowners can give you that those contractors would qualify for the rebates. And somebody on, on, on that list that doesn't really narrow it down to like the best of the best, but at least it's gone to that far. So yeah, so the comment was um, this is actually new in 2023 for the um, to be eligible for the mass save incentives, the installer has to be listed with mass save. And to get listed with Mass Save, the installer has to participate in a certain amount of training. And it's anticipated that those training requirements are going to ratchet up over time. I think this first year, it's not going to be a heavy lift, but you can one can anticipate in future years that they'll uh, require more training. And again, this is mostly to help, first of all, help get rid of some of the myths that you know, persist about heat pumps not being suitable in cold climates, number one. Number two, but what do you say? avoiding oversizing of heat pumps. We use them in, uh, in concrete. All kinds of heating and cooling equipment them. tend to be oversized. Right. It's and not just heat pumps. You say in, but it's important, you mentioned it's important for heat pumps to be properly sized. Yeah. So those are like that's the, nonsense. two of the big issues we've run into. That's yes, Tom. How do you know it's properly sized? Well, that uh, gets back to an earlier question. You know, uh, how do you know if, uh, yeah, if you get a quote from installer that the unit is properly sized? And, you know, honestly, you don't necessarily know uh, if you're able to get coaching um, through the Heat Smart Alliance. We do have a tool that helps us come up with an independent estimate based on historical fuel use. But short of that, you know, getting multiple quotes and comparing them. Um, Looking at your existing equipment is a little tricky because there's a good chance your existing furnace or boiler is way oversized too. In fact, if somebody quotes you a heat pump that has a heating capacity similar to your furnace or boiler, I would be suspect. It's probably twice what you want. What I meant was you already have that your source any slip uh -oh. and you're using them to heat your house exclusively. Oh, okay, so I'm sorry. The, the question was more if you have heat pumps installed already, um, what kind of things might you observe if your equipment's not properly sized? Well, if it's undersized, it'll probably become really apparent because your home, your thermostat won't uh, be met, right? Gotcha. If you don't have a backup system to keep it up there. 
Um, so yeah, that's pretty easy. If it's oversized, uh, it's a little tougher. Um, it can result in higher energy bills um, than you would otherwise have, but you may not have any baseline by, to compare because you haven't had the heat pump before. Um, it can result in some comfort problems, you know, with if equipments, even this variable speed equipment, variable capacity equipment will have some limitations in how often or how low in capacity it can go before it has to cycle on and off. And if it's grossly oversized, it'll spend most of the time in cycling mode because the load will be below the slowest or the lowest capacity you can operate at. So you may notice a lot of cycling if you pay attention to what your equipment is doing and you see a lot of cycling even on cooler days, the colder winter days, that's a hint that uh, things are oversized. Did you define a man, uh, Dr. Did you define a manual J here with that, with that use? Oh, uh, so the manual J, uh, there's uh, an organization called ACCA, a national organization that maintains this uh, process, but it's basically, um, a process for determining heating or cooling load for a home and the installer, uh, usually it's done by an installer. It doesn't have to be an installer, but um, it should be done before equipment is replaced. But again, uh, it's not always done. And uh, basically they take a lot of detailed measurements on your home in terms of window area, wall area, you know, uh, all, the, all the various dimensions and they, the most, um, Installers have software that does all the calculations, but it, you have to take a lot of measurements and you have to know something or assume something about the insulation in the walls and the ceilings and the attics and all that and um, put all that information into the model. You have to put in some information about uh, air leakage, which unless you actually test air leakage, you don't really know what air leakage is. You can do a blower door test, which will tell you that, but most people don't do that. So there's a lot of guesswork that goes in, uh, in most cases, but it's basically doing a, an analysis of your home based on the theoretical heat flow uh, and air infiltration you would have at the, whatever your design temperature is. And I'm told, it, to do it right takes six or seven hours. So if an installer is uh, giving you a quote and they have no idea if you're going to accept their bid and they're putting in six or seven hours just on that, you can see why they're reluctant to do it. Many installers estimate the equipment size, give you a quote and say, if you order from me, I will do a manual J analysis and confirm the equipment and before it's installed. Oh, manual J analysis? Manual J, letter J. Oh, town required, actually required one place that's doing it. Shelter required, you put in new ductwork, shelter required is that that ductwork tested by a third party, and you have to prove that it's only 4% of the So that goes back to like having all the ductwork. So the real solution to create about your own ductwork is to do ductwork, get all the modern state like modern requirements. Obviously there's a cost there. <laughs> so but you go back to what Matt Dillon said about putting heat pump in, put it through the docks, it'll probably work pretty well. And then you wouldn't have to go through all that um the testing. I did not hear a thing. Maybe you can translate it. Okay. I basically just said that. So I uh, have one last question and then we'll, I think we'll call it a night. I think this would have like a refrigerant and uh, a liquid in the line. Um, is there any uh, corrosive kind of element to that or leakage or anything over time that you have to be aware of if you're running a pump and you're not just liquid as a heat exchanger, right? Yeah, so the question is about the refrigerant and the heat pump, and uh, is there any corrosion or leakage over time? Um, if things are done right, if, if, if the installation is done well and the joints are made properly on the refrigerant lines, there shouldn't be any corrosion issues. 
those come up if um, an installer doesn't evacuate lines properly and or doesn't braze properly if they're make, using braze joints. Those can introduce contaminants or moisture. Um, but if things are installed correctly, uh, there shouldn't be anything in there that would uh, cause corrosion in the long term. Again, we're trusting the manufacturers that they've looked at material compatibility issues in their equipment and all that. And I, I think they do a pretty good job of that. So, so I don't think corrosion is a big issue, at least from the inside out. Um, again, this typically copper lines are pretty corrosion resistant from the outside in and pretty heavy wall uh, copper. So um, I'm not aware of too many corrosion issues. You can lose charge over time. Again, um, you know, if you have a factory sealed refrigeration system, that's your best situation. So for example, most heat pump water heaters or ground source heat pumps will be factory sealed because they're, they have good quality control and make sure all the joints are leak tight and tested. In the field, um, generally leakage isn't a problem, but again, if the technicians are in a hurry and they cut things short a little bit and they don't check everything and, and uh, do all their leak, leak checks properly, you know, you could end up with a leak or it's possible leaks can form over time for whatever reason. And, you know, I mean, it could even be a homeowner error that somehow you put a nail into a refrigerant tube by accident somehow. I mean, th those things happen. So, but I would say my guess is that most equipment doesn't have significant leakage, but you could still end up in a situation where five or 10 years down the road, you do need to top off the charge. So that's, that's another reason to have, uh, you know, service checks periodically to make sure you haven't lost any charge. Um, you did mention that it actually is a very potent greenhouse gas. So if it did leak, that would be good. Well, let me let me just take that as the last question because I do want to comment on that, and then we'll we'll call it a night. The question has to do with refrigerant leakage and uh, what impact that has on climate, because refrigerants are very potent um, global warming agents, and in general, refrigerants are a very uh, important category. But the vast majority of refrigerant leakage is happening in commercial and industrial refrigeration and cooling equipment. A residential heat pump uh, is very unlikely to leak that much refrigerant. There isn't even that much refrigerant in the whole system. Even if you had a catastrophic leak, you might lose five or eight pounds of refrigerant. But compared to a supermarket, a supermarket might have three or 4,000 pounds of refrigerant in the system, and it might leak 10 or 20 percent of that every year so that puts things in perspective but it does have a little i've there's not good data available it's tricky as you might imagine to actually know how much refrigerant leaks it happens you know a, a technician can make a mistake when installing and, and lose some refrigerant um but my best estimate is it lowers your um emissions benefit of a heat pump by maybe 8%, 10%. And probably even more importantly, if your alternative is to have a central air conditioner, you've got the refrigerant anyway. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll bet dollars to donuts that a conventional air, uh, air conditioner is just as likely to leak as a heat pump. There's no appreciable difference. So it's not gonna be different than your alternative for air conditioning. So, the new IRA Act, I heard, I think, requiring that the refrigerant used in new heat pump equipment gain from Sunday forward be a less potent type of refrigerant. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, there, there's a lot of work going on and yeah, looking so at. That's a good thing, even if yeah. it's you know, yeah. So we, yeah, we could get into a long conversation about where refrigerants are going, but there's a lot of research going on and improving refrigerants, but it is a balancing act because if you pick a refrigerant that has far less climate impact, if you lower the efficiency of the heat pump, when you do that, you're shooting yourself in the foot because now you're going to use more electricity and there, some of that's going to come from fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. So I think that's a good time to um, uh,
cut off the questions, but uh, thank you all for uh, participating tonight and especially those uh, from uh, your homes. Uh, thank you for joining in and putting up with some of our technical glitches. Let's uh, thank our speakers. We are, we are supposed to get on at 12.40, 30, but uh,